In an ever-changing world, with ever-changing lives, Life Changes Network presents a voice of truth and inspiration. This is Life Changes with Filippo, with unforgettable, ever-insightful conversations that captivate our fascination and insatiability for the inspiring moments of real-life journeys. As we, as one, strive for higher planes of existence and a better understanding of ourselves and the world in which we live, always remembering Life Changes. This is radio like you'd never felt before. This is Life Changes with Filippo, and tonight's special guest is Lamont Wood, author of Out of Place in Time and Space. And now your host, our MC, the Master of Change, Filippo Voltaggio. Ciao, everyone, and thank you, Mark, for that introduction. I don't know if anybody has noticed, but uh, talk about life changes. Introduction changes is what uh, is what we should be saying, because this introduction uh, seems to have been changing every single week, and I like this one. Um, I, I know next week's will be different, and I, and I actually kind of like the idea of the introduction changing every week. It's really fun. Um, and what's also really fun is is the conversation we're going to be having today with Lamont Wood. It, it's it's more than fun. It's it's fascinating. It's it's crazy, actually. Um, well, I'll 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 explain uh, as we get into it. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about while starting to go through this book, and then and then I no longer thought about it, <laughs> but um, because I'm I, I wasn't sure where to place it. Um, and I'm hoping that Lamont can can help me with this too. I I was thinking about some of the um, experiences that were talked about in in the book, and how sometimes we either get premonitions about things coming up. You know, like like you you think of something and then you don't think anything of it, and later on it happens, and you think, "Wow, I I was thinking that," or or you think of something and you do think of of. You, you do think, hey, I wonder if this is going to happen, and then and then it does happen uh, sometimes, uh, or a lot of times maybe. And I also, you know, people say if you write something down, then it happens uh, easier because your subconscious mind starts to work on it. Other other people say that, you know, that what's going to happen is already in the consciousness of the people, or or written kind of in the in in the software so to speak of of the world or or in the matrix so i i was thinking of all these things and and totally confusing myself because it 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 isn't something that we deal in every day and and i was thinking well maybe we should and and maybe this is different um uh but i was thinking of my niece who's only like 6 or 7 who who doesn't say and who's never said that she wants to be a ballerina. She's always Mm -hmm. said from day one that she is a ballerina. And so Mm -hmm. the way she walks, the way she talks, the things she talks about, and she literally says, us ballerinas don't do that. Or, uh, you know, us ballerinas like this or like to dress like this. Uh, it, it never, ever in her parlance does she say "wanna be," "will be," "hope to be," "should be," um, uh, "dream to be." No, she already is. And I just wonder if if that's kind of like putting it in the law, or if that's something that she's already born with. So it's already built in her matrix that that's what she is. I wonder if maybe our parlance of when we say, oh, I, someday I want to be a actor, an actor, um, if that actually uh, c- creates a, 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 a chasm in, in, in what is actual reality to what we've now screwed up by saying we hope someday to be or we want to be, and, and that if that is our desire then that means it's part of us already. Um, because you look at it, you know, usually people don't, like they say, the, the apple doesn't far t- fall too far from the tree. People don't usually say th- that they want to be things that that are too far from their current possibilities. So in other words, they're, they're, they're aligned at least in thought, but but... Um, 
do, do you see how this is like this slippery slope? I mean, uh, it, yeah, I <laughs> Lamont, hold on, because I, I'm going to I'm going to hope you answer to this in just a moment, because it, it has been confusing in my mind. And what Lamont does in his book is tell us about things that that either. Well, this is the other side of it. Like maybe this stuff has already happened. Um, so so he's he's got he's talks about pictures and and uh, paintings rather and 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 carvings and 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 books written about stuff and and maybe some people say that this stuff has already happened so maybe i have already experienced these things that i want to experience or think i want to experience but instead um and, and in this lifetime or in this dimension, I'm thinking I haven't experienced yet. So I'm going through the process of, oh, I hope, or whatever. So I'm going to wrap this up here by saying it is a bit confusing, um, especially when we don't look at it, and, and especially when we don't talk about it, and especially when we're closed to some of these concepts and... and, and um, uh, you, you know, you don't. We need to start considering that there's something obviously bigger going on. That there's more to this than meets the eye, and the stuff that meets our eye, we need to start looking at it. Uh, mm-hmm. The stuff that meets our conscious, we need to start thinking about it because something is happening when we think that something is happening when we see something. We can't just ignore it. And I'll give you one quick last example, is I studied art. I took art history. And in the books I had, I, I, I had to go and look just to make sure that the pictures and uh, paintings and all that, that Lamont talks about in his book, Out of Place in Time and Space, I had to make sure that I had looked at them before and not just looked at them, had a teacher walk me through the process. And let me tell you, I don't remember ever having talked about UFOs or aliens or helicopters or spaceships or anything in those paintings which are in my books. And Mm -hmm. so did we not see them? Did we see them and ignore them because we they weren't in our consciousness? What? I don't know. But I am so glad we are having this conversation because this confusion in my mind has to stop. And if I need to start saying I am a ballerina, that's a bad example, but um, I think you know where I'm going with that. Um, or I do see that spaceship in that painting that was done centuries ago, Um what does that mean? I, I need to start being conscious of all that. I do. At least that's what I feel. And I hope that we all start feeling that because uh, there, there's no, um, I don't think it's better to just hide from it. I think the ignorance is not bliss anymore. And with that, oh, no. we're going <laughs> <we're gonna> to take a <laughs> quick break and come back and talk with Lamont Wood right after this. Clean water is not enough. Reverse osmosis, distilled water, and most bottled waters are devoid of naturally occurring minerals. They are acidic, unstructured, and hard to absorb and rob minerals from the body. Ionways ionizers produce a super abundant supply of powerful antioxidants in each glass. Ionized water has a reduced molecular cluster size and a negative charge, hydrating you up to six times better. Water from an Ionways ionizer will help you restore your body to its natural pH balance, boosting your vitality. An ionized water more effectively flushes acidic toxins from within your body. Drink the healthiest water available today. Ionways Water Systems, their water changes everything. To learn more about Ionways Water Systems and how you can own one today, visit our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com and click on our sponsor page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. We are back. Uh, what uh, Our guest is is 
titillating our senses in a page turner uh, of a book called Out of Place in Time and Space, Inventions, Beliefs, and Artistic Anomalies that Were Impossibly Ahead of Their Time. Uh, our guest is Lamont Wood today. He's uh, not only an, an author of uh, this book, but about six others. He has sold more than 400 bylined articles to Byte, Compute, Information Week, the Chicago Tribune, and the list goes on and on. Um, he's a co-author of Net After Dark, the underground, underground guide to the coolest, the newest, and the most bizarre. He lives in San Antonio, in Texas, and we're happy to have him with us. Thank you, Lamont, for being on the show. Well, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> and, um, and again, addressing the points you were bringing up in your introduction, um, my book kind of takes that to the cultural level. Um, uh, is is the pre- is the future present in the present? Well, nope. I keep finding evidence that it is, or the past certainly is present, but the future sometimes is too. Um, in researching the book, it, it struck me that um, we really don't know anything about time. We can't isolate it in the lab. We can't even define it. And, um, uh, and throughout the book, I, I religiously stick to Occam's Razor. You know, the, the simplest explanation is the best. And applying that to the lack of evidence or, uh, with, uh, with regards to time, I have to uh, lean toward the suspicion that uh, there is no such thing as time. The passage of time is an illusion created by our perceptual uh, mechanism, whatever that is. And when you st- say all this, are we perceiving stuff in the future? Yeah, well, it's all happened it, or it never happened or whatever, you know, that time as as we think about it really is an illusion and we we don't understand it because we are stuck inside the gears of the machine it's mm. like fish knowing what water is they can't basically um anyway and a good example of uh like say the future being here in the present and of course eventually it becomes the past um <laughs> would be one of the examples i found in the book uh, the, the book is about uh, uh anecdotes that kind of fly in the face of a a, a specifically linear conception of history because I kept finding things that didn't seem to belong or people doing things that they should have been doing centuries later uh, or had knowledge that you wouldn't think they would have at that time. And the, and the freakiest example, uh, the one I can't explain because some of them I can, would be uh, Jules Verne, someone you've probably heard of. Mm-hmm. And uh, he wrote about 50 novels during his career, uh, not all of which were science fiction, the science fiction ones did contain quite a few uh, technological uh, predictions, but most of them were extensions of stuff going on in his lifetime and are no great mystery. But in 1865, he sat down and wrote a novel uh, about a U.S. effort to send uh, three men to the moon and an aluminum capsule launched from Florida. Uh, they get to the moon, they loop around the moon, they return to Earth, they land in, in the Pacific Ocean, and are picked up by the U.S. Navy. Now, does any of that sound familiar? <laughs> Indeed. Right. And uh, he even includes a fairly detailed budget for the project. Wow. And uh, I've seen a- analysis showing that if you include inflation, he was about, he was about 85% accurate for uh, the cost of the Apollo program up to uh, Apollo 8, which, of course, the, the, event, the, the event he's describing. So... Um, Apparently, he didn't allow enough for managerial overhead. A lot of amateurs do that. But where did he get this? You know, how, how did, uh, no, let's say there's a bunch of other uh, weird events, uh, similar prophecies that I can pretty much explain away. Lamont, this one I cannot. Th- what about the yeah. Titanic one? Ooh, that is, uh, being a writer, that one is, is, is chilling because it's a guy named W.T. Steed who was a, British journalist in Victorian era, and he was in on the founding of the uh, the tabloid genre. Now, recently, if to shut down the news of the world, we may be seeing you know the end of the genre. But he was there uh, and helped found it in the eighteen eighties, and he had all these uh, causes, and he 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 pursued and uh, with all the sensationalism and and uh, yellow journalism and uh, doing whatever it could to. Uh, you know, sensationalized things. And one of the causes he set out to sensationalize at one point was uh, the fact that the Admiralty laws did not require uh, passenger liners to carry lifeboats for everyone. 
And he wrote a uh, evocative fiction about what would happen if there was a mid-ocean collision. And the passengers realized there's not enough lifeboats and the panic that would break out and all that other stuff. And uh, in the course of his career, he became uh, rich, quite successful. Uh, so at one point, he decided to attend a conference in the U.S. And having become rich, of course, he got the best available accommodations for himself. And that was on the Titanic. <laughs> and uh, and you have to wonder what he was thinking as the water was rising. We don't know. He he was one of the fatalities. <laughs> but the irony of it is uh, almost blinding. And and that's another theme I, I encountered when I did the book. I kept encountering uh, tales of people who uh, successfully prophesized things. In fact, built the prophecy into their careers, and it was not always helpful. Not. You would think that would be the surefire route to uh, career success, you know, seeing things in the future successfully. Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, with him, you know, it sure, sure didn't with Debbie Keith Speed. Another example. Um, well, wait, before you be, move on, I, I, Lamont, I just want to let the listeners know because they're, they're not in on this, but but he actually, he, he almost predicted exactly the name or he, the name was close to Titanic, right? I mean, the boat is situation. Uh-huh. Could uh-huh. you talk about that a little bit? Um, I don't remember the, 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 I don't frankly remember he used the name of the boat, but he does uh, describe the, the setting fairly closely. Uh, in terms of the number of passengers, what went on in the course of the disaster. Uh, and right. it all matches pretty much what did happen in 1912. Uh, except that he was there. <laughs> I think he wonder, you know, as he, as he w- was getting on the Titanic, why didn't he stop and count lifeboats having done all that? But, you know, he had a busy career that he, he was involved in a lot of things that, that he probably, you know, uh, maybe it slipped his mind by then. We don't know. But the uh, <laughs> the irony of it is, 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 like I say, there's no escaping that. He should have had some um, kind of deja vu or something. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it may have been useful at that point. Um, another ex- example of someone who had correct prophecy and really didn't do him any good would be uh, Hector Bywater in the 20s. I think it was 1925. He wrote a novel uh, about a uh, war in the Pacific between Japan and the U.S. And it begins with a surprise attack and the Japanese overrun the Western Pacific. And then the Americans managed to launch an island hopping campaign which drives the Japanese back to the point where they're able to bomb Japanese cities. And at that point, the Japanese cave in. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Okay. And in fact, he, he has these uh, 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 fairly uh, blow by blow descriptions of some of the battles, and he names the ships involved, and some of them do show up in World War II, actual ships with those names. Uh-huh. Now, which seems freaky, but you gotta remember some of those ships are still around, and two, they recycled some of the names, especially the Japanese. So, um, and Bywater was a, uh, what they call a naval journalist. He was a, uh, a fairly, uh, uh, advanced expert, uh, in naval matters, and he was trying to, show that a war between U.S. and Japan would be uh, painful for both parties. And he had that one right. Um, uh, his, his book is not totally accurate. I mean, he he, uh, he doesn't place it inside a world war. It's just between the U.S. and Japan. Um, those final um, air raids in the Japanese cities, they just drop propaganda leaflets, and that's enough to cause a political crisis in the war. Uh, things like that. But there are uh, like, uh, there are things like uh, it takes two attempts to take Guam by the Japanese. And in reality, it took two attempts to take Wake Island nearby. Uh, little things like that just leap out at you. There's a, there's a big battle in, uh, near Iwo Jima, not, not on that island, but a nearby one. There's a big battle in uh, the, the Palau chain, not on Peleliu, but on a nearby island. You see, in his book, he, he has uh, the, the battles for islands with harbors rather than for, with airfields, because... That wasn't an issue in the 20s, but in the 40s, of course, things have changed a little. He doesn't foresee uh, things like radar or atomic weapons. Um, but you have to wonder what else he foresaw, because uh, he ended up drinking himself to death at the start of World War II. Maybe he saw too much. Maybe he didn't want to you know, go through this again. 
And doesn't that raise the question? I, I mean, you're using the words foresee um, or the word foresee. <laughs> it, it, did he foresee? Did he predict? It, was he was he there and then just came back and reported it? In essence, you're talking about there's no time. Um, yeah, or that yeah. we don't understand time. You know what I mean? I mean, or or did he write it down and then because it was written uh, as uh, you know, so it is written, so it is done. Somehow that manifested because it was written and a lot of people read it and it got into the consciousness. Do you know what I mean? Well, a little both. Uh, yes, a lot of people read it, including a guy named Yamamoto, uh, who you may remember he was the head of the Japanese Navy <laughs> at Pearl Harbor. At Pearl Harbor, and, right. Yeah, and uh, he absolutely had read it. He, in fact, had made a point of uh, meeting by water, and it was known to have lectured on the book in various Japanese uh, military academies. Um, and you have to wonder what he began to think as uh, things began to slow down after the, the first success and it seemed to be leading toward the rest of the book when Japan got defeated. But then he was he was killed in action, and was, so we don't know what his reactions were. We do know uh, a lot of uh, American military people did read it, and they skipped uh, a uh, stage of the book where the Americans try an immediate counterattack to uh, defeat the Japanese in open battle, and that doesn't work. In reality, they didn't even try that. They went straight to the uh, island hopping. Straight well, maybe because they, they, they maybe because, maybe because they, they read the book. Yeah. Work. yeah, yeah, yeah. They read the book. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, uh, but you have beyond that, you have to see it as sort of a metaphorical description rather than exact description, as you have to do, for instance, Jules Verne's novel. Uh, for instance, uh, in, the, in the World War II thing, he assumes that the opening surprise attack will be an attack on, on the Panama Canal rather than Pearl Harbor, which would have made sense, actually, but maybe that's why they didn't do it, you know, it's in the book. Um, and Jules Verne, he assumes that uh, the Americans use a cannon, and shoot men out of a cannon, which, of course, wouldn't work, but uh, rocket technology in 1865 wasn't such that it would be believable. So you stuck with something believable. Um so, uh, let's say if you, if you kind of stand back and accept it as sort of a metaphor, it becomes eerily accurate. If you look, if you try to, you know, do a column by column thing, you can see he's not, he did miss quite a few things. They both did. Um, but, uh, there's still, there's enough there to, to really get your attention and wonder what is going on. Yeah, that's um, not the only thing I'm wondering. I'm wondering, uh, we need to be careful I, 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 what we read, um, what we think, what we write down. Um, uh-huh. uh, yeah, yeah. This, it, it, it's, it's fascinating me. And actually, um, there, there are some other things that, that I want to talk about that I mentioned in the monologue about, like the flying saucers and the paintings. Oh, and yeah. So we'll do okay. that as soon as we come back. We are talking to Lamont Wood, who wrote the book Out of Place in Time and Space. If you want to learn more about Lamont, you can go to www.lifechangeswithfilippo, and we will um, give his website out as soon as we come back so you can get the book as well and just be just as riveted as we've been. Uh, Lamont, uh, we'll be right back with him right after this. There are self-help seminars costing thousands of dollars guaranteeing miraculous transformations. There are compelling speakers and life-changing weekend experiences where you can walk on fire. They all deliver revelations that guarantee you'll come back for the more expensive revelations filled with even greater wonder next month on Fiji. We get addicted to positive, heartfelt, expensive theater. What we really need is a jumpstart, an awakening, someone who can give us a reminder that everything we need lies within. Through inspiration and practical knowledge, Dorothy Donahue helps people get grounded and motivated, inspired and energized. It's not just words and affirmations and the power of intention. It's a mindset brought about by a tangible, transcendental experience, an audiovisual, physical, spiritual experience that helps us realize we transform ourselves. We get tools to become the conscious co-creators of lives of unlimited potential. Find out more. Go to DorothyDonahue.com. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with our host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can hear tonight's show and all our past shows, which include luminaries such as David Wilcock, Mariel Hemingway, Giorgio Sukalos, Marcy Shymoff, and Shadow Stevens on our archive page at our website 
at Life Changes with Filippo.com. That's Filippo, F I L I P P O.com. Remember, you can also connect with us via Twitter and Facebook, and now in our own community at LifeChangesNetwork.com, where real people come together to share real life in real time. That's LifeChangesNetwork.com. I am Filippo Voltaggio, and our guest today is Lamont Wood, who wrote the book Out of Place in Time and Space. Actually, he's written a lot of books and a lot of articles and papers, but this in particular uh, has just really captivated my imagination. If uh, this conversation has captivated yours, you can go and get the book at Amazon, amazon amazon.com. Uh, and the book title again is Out of Place in Time and Space. You can also, of course, always go to lifechangeswithfilippo.com and uh, and click on the link there for Lamont Wood, and it'll take you right to where you can purchase the book. Uh, Lamont, before we took a break, we talked about, or I mentioned, that I wanted to know more about these UFOs that were in paintings that I almost could have sworn that they weren't there when I saw them the first, mm-hmm. second, or third time even. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, and there's a story behind that. And okay. uh, uh, let me explain. Um, basically, we have our visual vocabulary, and they had theirs. And you were probably got some classical education and the visual vocabulary, and then it was sort of theirs. And nowadays, we have this pop culture visual vocabulary, of which discs in the sky have a specific meaning, and that was not shared by people doing church paintings in the uh, medieval and Renaissance periods. And that is the short and long answer. Now, I have some examples in the book of uh, church paintings in those periods that uh, appear to have flying saucers up there in the air. And some look quite convincing. But, again, you have to remember that they had their own visual vocabulary. And uh, round things in the sky usually uh, had something to do with the divine presence. And, uh, And you can't assume that they're trying to slip in depictions of UFOs because they were uh, always up overhead when they looked up or something. Uh, Everything in these pictures uh, is there on the basis of some decision, especially the guy paying the artist. And the guy paying the artist was some kind of churchman, (laughs) correct? And uh, and so the artist needed to deliver what his commission said. So uh, if you have, you know, a picture of the Virgin Mary uh, and Jesus uh, at the Nativity, and in the background, uh, there's something in the sky, and you see in the background, people reacting to it, and they have sheep around them. Well, you're pretty sure that this has something to do with the nativity story in right. the Bible, which mentions that there are shepherds in the, with their flocks in the fields, and they're confronted with the heavenly host, and they're amazed, and the angels tell them that, that Jesus is being born nearby. That is what the history in here, not a depiction of this, some visit by extraterrestrials. I'm pretty sure, um, as the results of my uh, uh, research I did for this book that if the uh, church had wanted to depict extraterrestrials, uh, they would have done so, <laughs> and there would be no ambiguity. We'd know all about it. Uh, and why wouldn't they? I mean, they dealt they with devils and angels and and uh, heretics and uh, uh, Turks and whatever, you know, uh, all this other stuff. Um, and e- E.T. would just been another, uh, you know, thing on the list. Right, uh, but there are quite a few examples, and, and in fact, uh, if you if you uh, there's tons of this stuff out there because, like I say, they had their own visual vocabulary, and they they put things in the sky uh, quite a bit, all the time, as far as apparently, um, it, and it goes beyond that. I mean, like one of these paintings uh, I talk about, uh, uh, where uh, the one by Crivelli, I think, where uh, it looks like uh, there's some kind of disc thing in the sky, and it appears to be shooting down. A laser beam at the Virgin Mary. Right. Uh, well, uh, when you get the high res version, that, that's a vortex of angels. You, you can, it's rather obvious. It's, it's not a physical object. And of course, but the, the so called laser beam, if you look at it, beside it, there, there's a dove. And, and that is straight out of the Bible, the, uh, the spirit of, uh, uh, of God descending like a dove on the person. And, but it goes beyond that. I mean, it's filled with imagery that is completely lost on us on the ground. Uh, for instance, in the foreground, uh, there's an apple and a cucumber. I'm sure that's there for a reason. I have no idea what it is. Uh, there's, uh, this, this, this is a painting about the Annunciation for when the Archangel comes to the Virgin Mary and tells her that she will be give birth to, uh, the Christ. And, uh, so the Archangel is there. And leaning over the shoulder of the Archangel is the, um, saint who is the patron saint of that particular city. 
And the archangel seems like a little annoyed. It's like waving to get out of the way or something. And you wonder, well, how did they have the nerve to put that in there? You know, <laughs> municipal boosterism. Well, and, I, I, so. you know, and there's a and there's a peacock right on top of the Virgin Mary uh, uh, on the building, right. perched on the building, yeah. and as if yeah, what's as that if, mean? As so. if it could poop on her. I mean, it's like yeah. I mean, I don't mean to be crass. I mean, I'm literally looking at this painting as if, you know, I've never seen it before. Or or bars on the window mm-hmm. that look like bars that we would use today. I, I, I don't know why they would have yeah, them burglar back. Bars. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Well, uh, bur- it's burglar bars. And they, I assure you they had that in Renaissance Italy. And for the same reason we have them today. Really? Oh, yeah. I, I'm looking so, uh, at this I, as if I've never seen it before. But you know that one. Okay, so that one you ex- you can explain away, or at least say that 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 disc in the sky is is angels. But there's there's uh-huh. another one that I'm I'm looking at that's also another medieval painting, 1428 here, where there uh-huh. there are there these are literally discs, and it looks like there are 15 of them, 20 of them. Uh-huh. Yeah, and the little rows and columns, because that is a stiffly done depiction of a snow cloud. And it's about a miracle that took place in Rome in the 300s or something, where in the middle of a hot day in August, uh, snow fell into an outline of a church uh, uh, in response to all these people having the same dream, saying that they were supposed to respond to this miracle and build a church there. Um, and uh, this is uh, our, our miracle of Our Lady of the Snows, I think. And, and you still see it celebrated in various places. The thing about it is there, there was no mention of this uh, miracle or, or uh, the story itself did not uh, emerge until about, about a thousand years after the church was built. So uh, obviously it was invented later. But um, uh, And this is an early depiction uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the legend. Uh, you can find plenty of other depictions of it, usually a lot more realistic, a lot more relaxed. But this is an early naive stiff version to do that by okay. someone who, yeah, who, who who didn't want to fill up the whole sky with a realistic snow cloud because he had put God and Jesus and the Virgin Mary or something above the cloud. Okay, so, so that's it looks like a disc. That's an interesting interpretation. Okay, so so that's not saying that the sky is full of of aliens. But how does one explain away? There's uh, the the crucifixion of of Jesus. It looks like uh, a fresco. Oh yeah, the one from Kosovo. Yeah, thirteen fifty. That was the one. Thirteen fifty, absolutely, because that is following Byzantine traditions uh, concerning depictions of the crucifixion. And uh, on one side of the cross, you have a celestial object that is red and has a male face, and the other side you have one that is silver and it has a female face. Right. It looks like they're, the but it looks like they're driving, like they're 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 driving a craft or something or a ball in the right. sky. Right. Right. It, it looks like um, uh, primitive, naive attempts to depict uh, Mercury space capsules. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. And uh, and people started noticing this in the '60s when the Mercury program was in the news. You follow what I'm getting at here? Uh, but going back to my original thing, you can find dozens of Byzantine depictions of the crucifixion that follow the same thing. You have the, the red male celestial object and the silver female celestial object. The red one is the sun. The female one is the moon. The red one is moving toward the cross. The female one is moving away from the cross. And this is uh, in keeping with uh, the depiction, uh, the description of the cru- day of the crucifixion and the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who say it was dark that day from noon to 3 p.m. So you have to have some code up there showing that the light conditions were changing. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So in, in... Like I say, they had their own visual vocabulary, and it was quite rich and extensive, and has nothing to do with our visual vocabulary. Right. So, so this... No, it seems like we're saying something different than what we were saying towards the beginning of the show when uh, we were saying that if there's no time, then these people might have been seeing spacecraft uh, of some sort. And I'm not necessarily saying alien spacecraft because mm-hmm. we have spacecrafts now, airplanes and whatnot. So so mm-hmm. were were they seeing something in the future? Did they actually exist back then? Well, well, let me say, in this, in this uh, particular 
uh, church or monastery, what is fresco, is painted on the inside of the uh, panel of one of the domes. Uh, there are plenty of outdoor scenes. N- none of them show anything in the sky except this one. And this one, the objects in the sky, like say, follow Byzantine traditions for depicting the crucifixion scene. Uh, so I think that's all it is. Now, beyond that, uh, you know, th- there's plenty of other stuff out there we can, we can argue about. Yes, did it's, uh, it's time, you know, is a little, if it's space time continuum is a little porous around the edges, uh, stuff would probably leak through. And, um, and there is stuff that gets your attention. But these particular examples, like say of UFOs, it's, uh, they can all be explained away. So I'm trying to get at it if you, if you stick to Occam's razor. Yeah, that is, that is interesting to, to have that explanation. Uh, so, so in, in, because there's, there's obviously some philosophical, uh, questions that that that, that the, all these uh examples raise kind of uh, summing it it up because your book is not just a collection of stories it's it's mm-hmm. saying you know something is either out of place or out of time and space so what what how would you sum this experience up in in your words of of, of this collection of stories so that that we don't understand time. It, it, that's what keeps leaping out at me. And, and it deserves the, more attention than it gets. We, I think we have to come to terms with the, the fact that we don't understand it, uh, that we may not be equipped to understand it totally, but we need to at least kind of feel around the edges of our ignorance uh, and, and figure out what we can understand and what we can't. And I think that would point us in the direction of what's actually going on in terms of time. Is, is it something real or is it something we just agreed to perceive because uh, our, our thought processes are based on a uh, serial perception mechanism. We have to do one thing at a time. If so, how do we think, how do multiple people synchronize that? How do we, and, and maybe we don't and always succeed in doing that. And that's how we get events uh, and stories like the ones that show up in the book. Maybe things uh, occasionally get out of sync, uh, maybe for a whole culture or maybe just for individuals. Uh, I, I really think we, have, have not scratched the surface in terms of what's going on with time. Now, now that um, we're, mankind is better organized technologically, it may be easier to come up with stories like the one I, uh, ones I've found here that, that, that would be better documented. Uh, now, with everything being databases and stuff. Uh, so uh, I look forward to that happening. But, uh, mm. but, uh, but again, that's based on the, uh, on the assumption of time, right? Something in the future. So, uh, right. I'm not sure. I'm maybe going in circles here. Hey, Lamont, Lamont, this is Mark Lazier. I wanted to, to chime in real quick and, and mention something. Okay. In listening to you speak and, and having a bit of a, a, a science background, <clears throat> wouldn't it, or, or am I correct in asserting uh, my feelings here that this is more the dance between this, the, you know, the serial ordering, the serial perception mechanism, and the multi, multi-dimensionality? Uh, in our abilities to reach up there in the dream state and, and, and achieve, you know, uh, across that timeline, future and past, as well as being able to do that in a lucid, you know, uh, awake state. Uh, mm-hmm. So we're, we're, in essence, blending our abilities, depending on what frequencies we're tuning into, to grab information or recognize perceptions in real, uh, 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 in, in real time as opposed to serial time. Is that making sense? That's, that's kind of how I'm seeing things well, from what you're saying. Well, apparently it does happen. Apparently we do pick up information from outside the sequential here and now that we're focused on to follow, you know, through logically about what I was talking about, assuming that, you know, time doesn't exist and it's a product of our perceptual framework. But this information that bleeds through, uh, what use is it? I mean, we can't really uh, uh, do anything with it. We, we, can't do, we have no basis for analyzing it. And um, as I talk about some of the things in here, uh, apparently there, there have been uh, things that show up that basically we didn't understand at the time it showed up. And um, you, you might say it was an artifact from the, the future or something. We, we simply had no basis for understanding it uh, until, until later kind of came into synchronization with the here and now. Uh, the one I leave, lead off with is kind of an evocative example would be that uh, painting that's been hanging in a museum in France for centuries now. It was painted in 1460. And it's fairly uh, conventional 
uh, really this painting of the Christ child sitting in the lap of the Virgin Mary. And we, for centuries, we paid no particular attention to what the Christ child was doing. Only in the last few decades did anyone like look at it with eyes that are tuned to the present and realize that the Christ child is depicted as playing with a pull string toy helicopter. Right. Which is kind of strange for 1460. Apparently, uh, those were not uncommon children's toys then. Uh, we, we, another theme I came across is that we, apparently children's toys are considered frivolous. No one pays any serious attention to them. And, and yet here's a flying machine <laughs> that kids are playing with. And nothing was done with it for hundreds of years. Um, I also came across the fact that the uh, uh, Greeks and Romans had uh, steam-powered toys, and they never thought to do anything serious with them. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, that's a, that's a digression. But uh, yes, uh, absolutely, there are things out there that uh, we simply can't process, uh, apparently, uh, or, or see them for what they as because they are not part of our present. Uh, you follow me? Am I making sense, please? <laughs> well, I, I I believe you you are. Uh, I uh, but but it it all makes sense, and and it none of it makes sense, which is kind of how mm-hmm. this this all started with the monologue. But I I am so glad that you have actually written a book that that starts saying, well, let's let's look at this because it's it's here. And it might serve if we give it a little bit more attention. And you have uh, helped focus us in that direction. So, Lamont, thank you so much for having written the book and for having shared uh, it with us uh, today on the on the air. Okay, glad to serve. <laughs> Look forward to connecting again when uh, when you can help us figure out even more things. But in the meantime, it's out of place in time and space. Uh, is the title of the book, and you mm-hmm. can find it on Amazon and, of course, by going to lifechangeswithfilippo.com. And our guest today has been Lamont Wood. Thank you, Lamont. Well, thank you. All right, cha-cha. We'll be back with our producer's wrap and our producer, Mark Leisure, right after this. Life Changes with Filippo is a premier radio show presented by Life Changes Network, which is a company whose team has dedicated their lives not only to positive change, but to helping others observe and embrace honor and even celebrate their own changes, thus enabling a more positive, inspired life and helping to create a more positive and inspired world. From everyday people to corporate giants, celebrities and children, we are here to help and to serve. With heart and experience, we bring our message and positive intent into your home or corporate office and even through appearances on your favorite shows. If you wish to learn more about Life Changes Life Coaching and a private consultation with one of us, corporate event appearances, or if you would like us to appear on your radio or TV shows, visit lifechangeswithfilippo.com and click on our representation page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. We're back. I'm Filippo Voltaggio, and we have Mark Leisure with us. <laughs> or do we? Did we lose Mark? Mark, Mark. Well, Mark's having technical difficulties, but here we are. <laughs> well, you were in another time, and I was. In, yes, I was actually out there exploring the multidimensionality of time and information. We need you here right now, though. But you can. I hate to keep you from that. I know how much fun that can be. Uh, you, you know, uh, we've been talking to Lamont Wood and and talking about his book, Out of Place in Time and Space. And Mark, you haven't seen this, um, but uh, there, uh, I. I don't know, maybe you have, but there's a movie, uh, gosh, what's it called? But it, it stars uh, two really funny Italian uh, men, one of them who is Roberto Benigni, and it's in Italian. But anyway, they're two friends who uh, go to uh, end up in a different time. Uh, they don't know how this happened. They were just waiting for the train to pass one day, and then all of a sudden, after the train passed, when they crossed the tracks, they were in a completely different time, a couple centuries beforehand. And at first, they were really confused and didn't know what was happening. And, and then they started laughing about it. And then they thought they would just 
fuck with the people <laughs> and tell them like what's to come and people would be like no 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 way and and one of the best parts is is they meet Leonardo da Vinci and they start telling him hey have you ever thought of making a helicopter or something like that and then he starts to design it and then uh, they go to who else did they go up to um i don't know but they're telling people what what they should do as if they're really smart oh one of them uh, tells a young lady that he's wooing. Um, he he sings her a song, and it's it's a Beatles song, and she's like, "Wow, that's a really good song." He says, "Yeah, it's going to be a big hit someday." <laughs> no, that's brilliant. So I could just see that in in, in reading this book. It, it's like, what if you know? And what if we're the, those people? There was a movie that had a similar thread recently, and I, I'm not placing it. Uh, but I think that is the interesting thing is, is, you know, we often say or you often hear people say, you know, art imitating life, life imitating art. And like most of the things most people do, we just kind of leave it there. You know, just like the old coincidence when somebody calls uh, right after you were thinking of them and they live 3,000 miles away. We just leave it there rather than delving into the ramifications, the odds of that happening, the why, you know, that, 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 that's enabling all that, you know, these kind of things, that, that type of integration of information, it, uh, where the inspiration is coming from, where the collective conscious, if, if we have now agreed that thoughts are things and, and we manifest our own reality and then on the greater scale, the collective manifests the collective reality then you also have to look at the collective uh, subconscious and, 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 and all of the images that are out there and what people have seen, when they have seen it. Then you go layers deeper and you start looking at that dream state and, and the parallel realities and where are we drawing information, visuals, you know, from future, past, other, uh, uh, you know, parallel worlds, etc. cetera. It, it, it's an, you know, to, uh, to infinitum in terms of, of information and input. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you said that because it reminded me of something that happened, what, uh, three or four days ago that, that I wrote somebody's name down that I wanted to uh, connect with when I got back from New York. And uh, and 15 minutes later, he called me. Now, this is somebody that I hadn't spoken to in a couple months. Um, and uh, also, on that same morning... I also sent an email to you and Dorothy saying, hey, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you think about having this guy as a guest on our show? And that guy contacted me that same morning after I sent out that email. And you actually had said, yes, get him. Um, he wrote me saying, I'd like to be a guest on your show. And it, it, uh, <laughs> the, the signs are all around. <laughs> which, which makes me think, be careful what I write what I read, what I think, you know, either be careful or it's already happened and I'm thinking it now. So, you know, or, or, or have fun with you, right. With what you write, what you think and what you're looking for. I think here's the, the, the fun part where we are starting to see this and those that are aware that are paying attention to their life that are, that are able to put themselves in a third party position and kind of watch what's going on around them. Ma the, the the process of manifestation is happening more quickly, so we have the ability to see direct results like that. Mm. I uh, I had an a, a, an instance at the bank that I had to take note of. I, I have a check that I get from a certain client that that always comes uh, regular way paper check, and I usually go to the bank to get them to put it in. It's into an LLC, so it takes time to clear. And so the bank will oftentimes release the hold while I went into a branch that wasn't mine. And the guy was clearly having a bad day, the manager. And we got into a discussion. I said, go in, you know, we explain the whole thing. And the discussion started going off track very quickly because he started advising me as to how I should do my banking rather than just doing what the other branches did and, and release the hold of the check and, and everybody's happy. And he asked me to step away from the counter so he'd go, you know, uh, put the, 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 whole, the held check in the account. And I had a moment where I could have reacted with anger and frustration and whatever kind of reaction, you know, would have gotten his goat. And I said, you know what? Nope. I'm, he's clearly having a bad day. I'm just going to put some love out there. Everything's fine. 
I don't really need the hold release, so it doesn't matter whether he chooses to or not to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he comes back and he goes, "I deposited the check and I released the whole thing. Have a nice day." <laughs> and it was a complete about face with n- no other catalyst, no possible catalyst for an about face in his energy and 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 and, and uh, you know the result then my internal change of energy and, and, and what I put out there, you know, at a quantum level, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and actually speaking uh, of your beliefs, I, I, I remember one time I was saying something, I was a little flustered with a certain situation and I couldn't figure it out. And you just looked at me and smiled and said, you know, on some dimension, we have this all figured out. And I, I don't know, it, did you know how you were saying that? Because there are a lot of different ways one can take that. Uh, I, I, I think so. Yeah, because... I, I think I knew how I was saying it. <laughs> how do you think I was saying it? <laughs> well, no, I, 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 I've I just come up with two ways. The, the way I thought on the day that you said that is it's like, you know, on another dimension, it's all figured out, but here it's not. So it's kind of like, oh, well, so it is. But but now I was thinking the way you kind of said that is in another dimension, it's all figured out. So it should be clear to now to us if we just connect with that time is and, and therefore a consciousness is expanding. And so perception and result uh, are, are happening more quickly and more readily. So one thing may be figured out on another level, but we still have to be able to play by the rules and alter our way of thinking and being in order to affect the change that we're looking to affect that's already figured out on the other level. I like that. Actually, I like that a lot. And I like your bank story. And, and it reminds me of similar stories. And I, I recently had one, actually, the trip I'm going to take in a couple hours here, where someone didn't book my ticket in time, who was supposed to, who was going to, you know, I'm, I'm performing someplace. So they're paying for the ticket and everything, and they didn't do it in time. So now I'm not able to get the direct flight and I'm not able to uh, leave at the time that I wanted. And so they're offering me these suggestions, which are not what I wanted. And I started to get upset. Like, why didn't they just do what they were supposed to do? And now I don't have, to, I wouldn't have had to be inconvenienced as much as I am. And then, and then I started to remember some of these conversations that I have with you and Dorothy and, uh, and other friends and colleagues. And I said, okay, if I'm writing this script, then I know that this is perfect. And this is actually better than what I had thought it should have been. And of course, I didn't believe that right away, but I started to convince myself that that was the case. And then come to find out that we find a better flight at a better time with more leg room and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and, there it is, when it wasn't there before. Well, maybe it was there before, but we couldn't see it because we were on this track. Well, I, I, and this is, I think, the, the, where it gets fun. We have a team of writers. <laughs> Splay. Right. I like we, it, Splay. We, we have a team of writers. There obviously is the, the, the primary, the project manager, if you will, our higher self, but each one of our multidimensional selves in each parallel reality is contributing to that whole and to the energy and, uh, that w- and the experience that we are looking to achieve. So that information is incoming from multiple sources and will affect. If you've learned something in one level, you probably don't need to relearn it at another level, and therefore you may aim for a different experience. And, and, and so there's so much more going on in terms of the dance that we're dancing. Uh, you know, this is a, maybe we'll do a show on this at some point. <laughs> maybe we'll call it life changes <laughs> because it does As it does a- indeed <laughs> so uh here we come to uh the end or it could be the beginning or we might be in the middle of an episode of life changes with filippo uh since we've been out of place in time and space with Lamont Wood and with Mark Lejeure. Um, Who knows where we are, but it's good to be here or have been here or, uh, or we'll just leave it at that with that. (laughs) 
I started, I, Mark, I started this show confusing myself. Yes, your, your, your serial perception mechanism is faltering <laughs> at the moment. But, but I think our listeners are with us, so all good. <laughs> all right. Well, with that, uh, I, Filippo Voltaggio, uh, along with our producer, Mark Lajor and Dorothy Lee Donahue, and our engineer, Don Newson, uh, thank you for being part of our world part of this show and part of the changes, positive changes we all wish to see in the world. Ciao, everyone. You have been listening to Life Changes with Filippo with the master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Listen live every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the BBS Radio Network and visit us online at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Today's show has been made possible in part by our sponsors, Ionways Water Systems, Change Your Water, Change Your Life, and Love and Miracles with Dorothy Lee Donahue. To learn more about them, visit the sponsor page of our website. Once again, join us here next week as we consciously explore and embrace the only constant, life changes. Now's the time. Now's the time.